Bon, bonjour à tous. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Antoine Cardon. I'm one of the founders of VR Group and CIO. I'll begin with the question before, which is what is location-based entertainment, even if it's the subject a very important, and it's a Trojan horse for VR to find its market. It's maybe location-based, uh, are all the experiences in a given uh, location that's out of home. Cinema and arcade is location-based. So that's what we mean by location-based. So quickly, TV Group was founded in 2011. Today we're about 50 people, more. And uh, we've just uh, raised funds. We're growing very quickly. We're structured. We have four activities. Historically, we did TV services. We work for brands. And we do digital uh, applications, mobile applications. And what we do now, craft technology, we have uh, uh, digital uh, furniture in stores, shop windows, connected uh, spaces for brands. And about five years ago, Red Bull came to see us to see if uh, if we could uh, uh, teletransport their uh, fans to uh, places where they had events, so we began what we call 360 VR location-based experiences. It was quite technical. We integrated people who came from cinema, television, who knew how to make content, and that began that expansion was. Uh, uh, has three other companies, one which we call DV Studio, which is a studio uh, where we make original content with new formats to serve new uses, mainly VR and AR, but other things, interactive content, there's another activity which we call DV Indoor, which is a franchise and it's for uh, helping people set up places for uh, VR. And then we have a structure called IP, DV IP. It's important to protect your ideas, to negotiate with rights holders of IP, we sell some big ones in the previous talk, and to commercialize products based on innovation that we've established in the studio. We undertook an experience last year, which we presented in Cannes, called Alice, the Virtual Reality Play. For us, it's a, a good context for location-based entertainment. Now, Alice was atypical of this experience. You were able to go into a film this, this dream we've all had as kids to enter into a film and become a film hero. That's what we try to establish. So it's an experience that um, is very much location-based because you can't do that at home simply because uh, there's an actor. The experience lasts 20, 30 minutes and takes us all over the world. So we went to many festivals and uh, show this to very different audiences. So very quickly, I'll show you some images here. One of the problems in Alice was to build this grammar. Some of Mike, Mike was talking about having a very natural interaction. The idea was that people could understand on their own that they had to move around, that they could interact with objects, that these objects had a weight, 
Ensuite, les, les personnages that uh, étaient characters were really there. Here you have the rabbit. You can touch the rabbit. He's touching your shoulder, comment on your the way you're dressed, and all of the virtual set are tangible, are reproduced in reality, and we're going to be able to play with props and accessories that uh, will go between the real and the virtual characters to really have a feeling of presence we go quite far we can eat mushrooms for example so that's something we were sure that would not work but hundred, well, everyone ate the mushroom so you can get people to do quite amazing things in virtual reality once you brought them into the context properly and you give this feeling of being present I talked about immersion it's the same principle. So that was our challenge in 2017. We were, the idea was to offer a location-based experience because we imagined then that it was a really good way of finding our business model. In VR, globally, uh, the producers of content, the people who made platforms were all looking for the same thing, which is a viable economic model uh, so that the work we do can be uh, monetized or at least break even to create revenues that come from the actual spectators, the actual audiences. That was complicated in a lot of areas. We'll talk about that quite quickly. So in 2014, we had the first uh, mass market offer for headsets with uh, Oculus and Google with Goods Cardboard. So it's an old experience. Uh, 360 video, the first was in 1900, the first VR helmets come from the 50s. It's an old story, but it was the first time that you had mass market offering or general market offering uh, available at uh, accessible prices. So it's becoming a hot subject. There's a big trend since 2014 on virtual reality. In 2015, the ecosystem began to take shape. So we had to develop content to put into these uh, headsets. And at the time, uh, we were beginning to do 360 degree video. In 2015, we had the first cameras come out, which were industrialized at the time. The cameras for Facebook, Google, Samsung, and people like that who came up with these cameras. So the ecosystem is coming together. 2016, the uh, people, the, the uh, vendors uh, were uh, targeting uh, home users, uh, VR, Sony, uh, HTC, HTC who t brought out their devices. It didn't work as well as they expected. And uh, now, a few years later, uh, it's still not the case. In 2017, uh, via mobile VR at home really didn't work as much as people thought it would. Uh, like a very small percentage of the population has a VR system at home. The, uh, Scaling out at home, it's hard to deploy, it's expensive, and it has to be powerful <laughs> and in space. And so this trend in domestic VR, home VR, didn't stop but continued its growth at a 
normal rate. And in 2018, the hot subject is location-based. These are places then, entertainment places where people uh, go for a VR experience. We had 800 spaces in China already dedicated to VR in China. This continued uh, in places often uh, operated by historic operators like IMAX and MK2 in VR in the library in Paris. So it's really the hot subject right now. And the reason for that, and why are we repeating ourselves, is that in fact, if you look at uh, the past and uh, all of the disruptive technologies, they were always deployed in this way. They began out of home, which were eventful and unusual, so we went out for these experiences. It's the case of the cinema. We went to see the Lumiere brothers not at home on your mobile phone at the time. We went to a cafe. There was a screening cinema as well. Cinema theaters, film theaters, and then uh, and we had television, which brought it home, and then we got mobile content. Telephone was the same thing. We began about, uh, going uh, to the telegraph office or the car or, or, or some store and, or post office. Then we got telephone at home, and then we were able to put it in our pocket. Video games were the same thing. Given the age of people here, everyone went to an arcade at some point in their life. And then we have the first consoles, and now we have mobility, where you can play on your telephone. Well, VR is the same thing, even if we try to sell us that everyone very quickly would have all sorts of VR equipment. We have an a adoption pattern that's traditional, and uh, the original economic model will be location-based. Then it'll come home, and then at some point we'll have some sort of virtual reality experience on mobile devices and make the difference between VR and 360 video. It's not quite the same thing. VR, you have to be able to move around to get a sense, a feeling of presence that's effective to have really interesting experiences. So these devices haven't come out yet in mobile form. They'll come out, but not yet. If you look, this is very important because uh, we were told that it was going to move really fast and that there would be a huge market in very little time. And there are articles today which are coming out saying that said VR is a failure. You have to take some distance from that. When you look at the adoption rates of previous technologies that were disruptive, we realize that VR is on the highest adoption uh, rate compared to internet, cell phones, PCs, VR is going almost more quickly. <laughs> this gives you an idea. When the iPhone came out in 20, 2007, uh, 6 million iPhones sold. When VR came out in 2016, there were 5 million kits that were sold and 1.6 million with the HMD devices, which is not, that's not including cardboard. So we have 
uh, an adoption speed that is fast as mobile telephones, and we all have mobile telephones, so tomorrow we'll probably all have some sort of a VR device, but it's not as quickly that the idea that in two years everybody's got one. So why location-based, and why is the business model important here? Because today we've produced a lot of content, went on to mobile platforms, YouTube, Facebook, but there's no monetizing uh, model because the uh, spectator, the audience doesn't pay, so it's an industry based on money that the uh, vendors, the equipment vendors, the GAFAs, and the big players who want to take positions in the area. But it's the institutions that help in France, the CNC, uh, various broadcasters are participating in this trend, but we don't have an economic trend in the interest of location bases that the final users pay a ticket to pay for uh, uh, the venue and uh, the material and the production. There's a lot of big releases this year. Uh, there's The Void, which is a company that has a few years of experience and applying its experience on big screens and where you can move around large space. So it's a big space, then a room uh, we're uh, in an experience to have uh, 250, 300 square meters, 2,500, 3,000 square feet. And uh, we, uh, the, the void are very gamey experiences. We have a gun, and uh, we're going to shoot. Uh, uh, before we had a Ghostbusters. Today they put out a Star Wars uh, version. There's another company, the first company, to have done location v, location based VR which is an Australian company, Zero Latency, who have 18 locations worldwide. And uh, in terms of rates, or 30 to 45 dollars a euro for 15 to 15 minutes to half an hour. They to our position a bit differently. Uh, the, the void is mainly in places that have to increase traffic. In New York, for example, it's Madame Tussauds Museum. They've invested in a short experience and uh, they have a ticket price that's relatively low because they want people to come in to visit the museum. It works well. Some of the people from the team went to Europe to look at the void and uh, we finally hung out at Madame Tussauds for two hours and it's a model that works but is not uh, profitable on its own. Zero latency is uh, standalone. Uh, there are longer experiences and they cost a little bit more. Hologate is another model because here you're in the arcade. These are small experiences. You pay a pretty cheap price. And there are big centers being developed. We talked about IMAX and, and MK2, which are bigger size, but in China, they're moving forward on this. They've made huge investments. East Valley of Science and Fantasy. And we're looking at uh, a billion dollars or euros, huge investments. Investors really believe in this, and they're really putting their money in this. BVR, K in Dubai, 7,000 square meters, 70,000 square feet, 80,000. And uh, it's 3 to 10 euros per ride, 
that's how we have very different models. Minute, uh, ride, ticket, for the zone. So we're still looking for the model. What's important is that the uh, viewer pays. Altogether, outside of China, there are 600 places where you can experience VR. Last year, we had 100 places, so clearly it's growing. Two big players who are very different, who have uh, very different business models. You have the content producers, and then you have the uh, venues. So today you have operators who do both. So if you look at history, uh, for example, of the cinema, the uh, producers and uh, the uh, screeners were together, and then they uh, split. So on one side you have studios, production studios, developers, 3D people creating property, and then you have entertainment centers, uh, theme parks, uh, arcades, uh, <coughs> some more sort of laser games, bowling alleys, these sort of leisure centers. Uh, the model of the uh, franchises are quite uh, different. You have a ticket-based approach, and another which is time-based, revenues, monthly revenues, with an average uh, use is 200 to 400 euros per square meter. So it's not very big. Uh, the cost center, the main things are, is what will give back to the con content, the producer, the models, uh, HS Void, uh, for the people who create property. It's 30, 50 percent that goes back to the content makers. And, and a big uh, IP as well, the Void, for example, on Ghostbusters. We're looking at 30 percent for the Void and 7 percent to Sony. So 37 percent of the ticket price goes to content producers and IP. For Star Wars, we're looking at uh, 55 percent of the price going to content producers and the property owners, the asset owners. So Disney takes 30 percent of the ticket. So IP is quite high. The content producer models are very different. So, so they're looking at a, some sort of a economy of scale with a model that's close to that of the film industry with productions that cost quite a lot of money. We took an example here of 500 to a million euros, 500,000 to a million euros. That's what we can do today. The objectives in production costs globally, worldwide, the leaders are looking at 3 to 15 million because uh, we want to be future proof. A lot of the goal, uh, so with uh, a, a lower budget, we're looking at 30% of the uh, turnover done in the location, so one or two years before getting your cash back, because there are very few places that are VR uh, venues, even though it is growing. And when you produce a film, uh, you have access points that are much more numerous, and it's easier to uh, make profit. Well, it's a model that's better for the time being, obviously. So for content producers, the need is to uh, make as many deals as possible and to uh, help set up uh, these locations uh, to be able to get their production out there. The creation of content is a, a challenge, and that's the key, because without con content you won't have a market. 
and it's important. It's a significant problem today because uh, there are big players today who are ready to provide services. Amazon has a platform that's already TV 360-degree video. They have another platform that rolls out at a room scale, but they haven't been launched because uh, they had a problem with somebody and they lack content. And they're lacking content for the launch to be able to refresh content every month and they have to find partners to produce four volumes on a significant scale. That's what they're looking for today and that's what uh, all the platforms are looking for. So content today is really the main question. The second thing that's changed in terms of content, I think you've all seen, all seen the rebranding in, in Hollywood, the merge in the studios, players coming on like Amazon and Netflix that have ch who have changed the model, the production model for cinema. Before we went to sell films in a market, and the profitability was based on uh, box office today for a platform like uh, Netflix. They buy rights that don't have any link to the number of people watching. We don't know. That really changes how you produce content. The other which is changing the way we work is that uh, the tools that allow you to m make this content have completely changed. We don't use cameras anymore. Um, we are using uh, 3G uh, captation systems and cameras uh, no longer work. You have to displace yourself. You have to move around reality. This timeline here brings us to realistic volume content. Everybody makes the distinction between 360 video, stand up, room scale, and large film. Everybody's understood the difference in terms of production between a content that's live film which is uh, uh, where you can't move around and in, in, in volume content which allows you to uh, feed all these places location, room scale location based etc and this is your experiences you can do live and you can see the difference between 360 and uh, 3D content, volume content, and so clearly where that's the direction you have to go in, to, in, and that requires a different way of working. So we began look at, at a volume, a realistic volume control, which began mainly in architecture, in simulation, and now have gone quickly to video games, and we had photographic uh, VR experiences. So the, and then we then saw systems that allow you to have capturing of human beings. We see an example here with a mother and her baby. You see, it's still very uh, pixelized. It's not very good in definition. And in the, the near future, we'll have 100% photorealistic, and we won't be able to distinguish between reality, and there'll still be a possibility of moving around. So what are the stakes? I'm going to explain to you why it's a very important call IMAX VR when they launched 
the place, the location base. They gave $50 million to the studios, to the major studios, so they could produce content and volume content. And they didn't receive anything in return because the studios did not manage to produce the content because it's quite complicated actually and it's very new. So the first stake is to industrialize, industrialize the production because we could do R&D, everybody knows uh, about Nitro, Itro, Itro, sorry, a lot of uh, people have worked with Itro, it's complicated the sh from a shooting point of view, post-production, and the deployment is very complicated. So this is the first stake, which is to create tools to produce volume content, the same way that we produce traditional content. One of the ways that we could be, could be used today is to use uh, video game techniques and to create avatars, 3D avatars that we're going to reactivate with motion capture techniques and facial capture techniques. So these are things that we do with our partners and uh, we have a very high quality result in VR. You don't see the images in the same way because you are present in the virtual space. So that fake aspect that you have on the images is not so um, so annoying in the VR context. I think most of you have seen in GDC this example. That's what is best in terms of photorealism. Everything is done in real time. And this is a character that is completely virtual, that is integrated in a video game engine. And this is the actor who has a motion capture outfit and a camera attached to his head, her head. I think you must know the word uncanny valley which is a very strong reaction of the human to a representation of a human being that is close enough but not that close. So, so it's a rejection, react, a reaction of rejection of that image. And I think we've passed, we're past that. And in VR, we don't make a difference. And we feel like the people are real and they're with us because we can go around them and get close to them and we can interact with them. That could be very simple interactions, like on the enemy, for example. There was only the look of the characters that would follow the, the spectator. It could be some things that are more complex or more realistic, like the character on top of looking at you would actually answer your questions. We can go very far in that interaction. We can use artificial intelligence as well. The second stake is to increase the value production and the IPs are key for that. Mike showed us some very good uh, study cases with major big IPs. Of course, the IPs capture some audience, give visibility to the project and regroups everyone around a, a movie, a cartoon. It's very easy to get people around those contents and make them discover some virtual reality. The third stake is a multi-user. What is that? It's a stake um, in terms of experience. As the same way when you go to the movies, it's a social experience. You want to gather to have this experience with other people. The social aspect is very important. And it's very important from a business point of view because if you can have 25 uh, persons at the same time in this experience, of course, you make more profit than you have one person at a time. So that leads 
to my next milestone, which is on our end, why not integrate 25 people simultaneously in an experience that will be of the same type than Alice, which means that you become the hero, the main character of a movie, and this experience that will deploy as of the end of this year. I don't know how I'm doing with time. I just want to say a few words in terms of models, and that will be my conclusion. The way of deployment is a bit different. I presented you some location-based approach that are more for a bigger, wider audience, where the point is to get a lot of people in, and as content producer, to deploy the content in many places to be more profitable. The name of the project, I can tell you, it's beyond. We're on a model that is slightly different because the idea is to is not to deploy the content in many venues, but only in only one venue and have a positioning which is more like Punch Drunk or the Cirque du Soleil to have a very exclusive and premium experience. It's going to be a longer experience that will be over an hour combined with a restaurant and a bar so you can have a place, a venue that you could do fun, fun things for over an hour or two or three hours even and it would be above a hundred euros per ticket so we're really um, on a uh, price point that is different which is for more for like a premium show so that's a different model. I think I am done. <laughs> Thank you to everyone.